Let's talk about the basics that every fighting rifle should have and what it shouldn't have. It's gonna be a quick rundown of what I personally believe are the bare minimums that every fighting rifle should have. What I mean by a fighting rifle is going to be your basic carbine, or it could be a rifle length, 16 inch, even a 20 inch if you wanna run like a classic M16, uh, whatever your primary weapon's gonna be. Not a specialized weapon to do all, whether it be home defense, homeland defense, offense, your go-to do-it-all firearm. As we all know, the market's flooded with AR-15s and similar weapon platforms. There is a weapon platform for anything you could possibly imagine, from zombies to aliens to terrorists, anything you could imagine, it's out there and it's specialized for it. This is my go-to do-it-all rifle, or pistol. This is a Colt. M4 upper receiver with a nice armament, rail guard, all the goods. Um, it was originally, I believe it was a police surplus, got a gun show. Uh, the upper is all Colt and Knight's armament. It was originally a 14.5. I cut it and rethreaded it to 10.3, which makes it the CQBR close quarters battle receiver variant. The receiver is a stripped arrow with Geisley SSA trigger pack, uh, SBA4 pistol brace. So this is not a rifle. This is a pistol by all legal definition, but I'm going to keep referring to it as a rifle because I'm not a retarded ATF agent. So from the ground up, you want to start with a good round. It's hard to beat 5.56 five, these days. You can get out and reach a target up to 1,000 meters effectively. Maybe not out something this short. Barrel length, velocity, it's all going to get better the longer you go. So let's talk about the gun itself, what you have. If you're not going to buy from a reputable company, if you want to build your own, uh, the most important things you should spend your money on are your barrel, your bolt and bolt carrier group, and your trigger. Those are the main guts of the rifle. Your barrel is going to give you all your accuracy and the longevity of its lifespan. So that's something you really don't want to skip out on. Uh, trigger it's going to give you precision ergonomics it's going to make your life easier smoother it's not critical that you spend two three hundred dollars for a geisley or something but the nicer the trigger the more you're going to enjoy your rifle and your bolt carrier group your bolt face all of it that's the bread and butter there that's the moving parts inside the rifle that's the freaking engine in your chevy nova that's the most worn part in there normally. So don't skip out on your bolt carry group if you're building your own rifle. There are plenty of good reputable companies you can get this stuff from uh, without spending like Novesky costs. You don't have to spend five, six grand on a decent fighting rifle. Yes, those are nice. And yes, we're gonna make fun of you if you buy cheap stuff. But you don't have to spend huge money to have a decent rifle. Uh, this with suppressor, I've got just about 26, 2800 and by the time it was all said and done. But like I said, you don't have to spend that kind of money to get a good fighting rifle. I, I like to think before your optic, if you want to spend around 800 or so, you can get a decent rifle that you can, one, count that it'll be in spec from the factory. You're not going to have to send back because the holes aren't drilled right, alignments are off. You're going to get good enough quality control there. Two, you're going to get normally good warranties if you spend a little bit better money you're going to get more of a lifespan out of the product in general and again you're coming from a reputable dealer they'll most likely work with you if you do have an issue next and it's honestly as important as the rifle itself is your optic as you can see here i'm running an eotech that is my personal favorite it's a good close quarters reticle it's a big bold reticle uh, you've got other things on the market like aimpoint Trigicon, all kinds of good names out there if you want to spend good money on them. These normally run you about five, six hundred. Uh, Aimpoint Pro, I think, runs you about four now for new one. Uh, Trigicon, you're looking upwards of a thousand bucks for a good optic from them. But again, you don't have to spend the cost of your rifle on your optic again. I know a lot of you can't afford that. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but don't put an airsoft optic on your fighting rifle. 
I will ride you nonstop until you stop being retarded. Do not put Chinese junk on your rifle, especially the optic. If you put a cheap $25 Amazon red dot on your fighting rifle, it's going to lose zero every time you pull the trigger. They are worthless. You're trying to cheap out where you shouldn't. The optic is next to a rifle where the most money should be spent. If you're looking to spend a decent amount, if you're gonna spend six to 800 on the rifle, you should at least be willing to spend three on the optic. My go-to optic for something like that would be a Vortex, also like SIGs. I have one SIG optic that works fine. I don't have it on anything right now, but it's a good little optic, uh, Romeo 5. But if you want something that you're going to actually train with and be willing to bet your life on in a long, drawn-out conflict, anything like that, spend the money on it, if you can. I understand a lot of you, this economy sucks. Uh, I understand you can't spend huge money right now. It's perfectly fine. But just realize that just as good isn't a thing. You're not going to get Noveski, Bravo Company, FN. You're not going to get that kind of quality out of a PSA. And don't go to Anderson, for the love of God. Do not buy an Anderson anything. Everything they touch is garbage. I will. I don't care if it's for a range toy or anything. Do not buy an Anderson. They're garbage. There's a lot of debate between the PSA and the Anderson, which one you should go with. PSA all the way. I used to think they were the same. I was wrong. PSA stepped up their game lately. <clears throat> Anderson is just getting left in the dust. If you watch SHOT Show 2020, PSAs really listen to their customers, and they've also upped their uh, quality control standards by a bit. So for a range toy or a backup, something like that, PSA all day, every day. So when looking into a fighting rifle optic, there are a few things you should look for. Uh, if you're gonna go for a battery powered optic, you wanna look at battery life. If you're gonna to have to carry extra batteries for long periods of time, something you should consider. Uh, make sure they're shock proof and waterproof or water resistance at least. Uh, EOTechs are really tough optics, I love them. Uh, but make sure you get something waterproof, that's really important. There are plenty of other options out there besides holographic or reflexite. Really popular right now are your LPVO low power variable optics. They just look like a standard rifle scope. Uh, that's really handy for a fighting rifle because you can go down to a really low power, even down to like a zero or one power. And then you can go up to a six power and you can get on them almost as fast as a red dot. So those are getting really popular right now. I don't have one myself, but I'd like to get into that eventually. You don't want a fixed rifle optic, like a classic rifle scope that's set at like 6 to 12 power or something like that, like a fuddy hunting rifle scope for your fighting rifle, because you don't want to have that kind of magnification if you have to go clear buildings. That's good if you want to do a designated marksman rifle, something like that, a bench rifle, it's fine, do it on that. And then, of course, when you're talking Trigicon or Meprolite, you have tritium power optics, which give off a radioactive isotope that glows, so they're not battery powered. You can get battery backups for some of them, like I have a Meprolite M21. It has a battery backup that I can count on if for some reason the tritium isn't bright enough, if it gets washed out. Uh, wash out is a huge deal with those. If they're using fiber optic to bring in extra light, if you're shooting from a dark building out into the sunlight, you're not gonna get enough of a reticle to see where you're pointing. So that's something to consider before you buy something like that. They do have the appeal of the 15 year half-life, no battery, stuff like that, but they do come with their downsides. Also with Vortex, uh, if you join a website or an app, it's called expertvoice.com. Uh, Expert Voice offers between 30 to 50% off all of their optics to any first responders, uh, public safety, law enforcement, or military active duty or retired. As long as you have a pay stub or an ID that you can uh, email a picture of them to, you can get that discount. So after your optics, something important to have is backup iron sights. Like I said, mine has the fixed front sight post, and I have a Matek rear sight on there. And a lot of people don't run them, they say you don't need them. Well, that's fine, hope you have a good optic. But if for some reason your battery dies, your optic gets shot, destroyed, how are you gonna aim your rifle? 
No, I'm waiting. Please tell me why you don't need backup iron sights. No, backup irons are very important to have because you don't want to be dead in the water without any way to uh, aim your rifle. All right, next, flashlights. There are so many flashlights on the market right now. Uh, Surefire is kind of the go-to right now. You've also got Streamlight for a step below and Olight under that. There are so many options out there for good lights right now. Don't buy Chinese lights. Don't buy an airsoft light with a built-in laser. It's gonna break. Get something, again, shockproof and waterproof. It's not hard to find in a flashlight these days. This flashlight I have on here, actually, uh, came in a loot box that the girlfriend got me for Christmas last year. And it's just a handheld flashlight that I thought, this is a really nice flashlight. So I got a universal light mount on it and it fits perfectly on there. Couldn't tell you who makes it. I looked it up, it's like a $150 flashlight, something like that. It's a really good, really bright flashlight uh, with multiple settings on there. So that's what I use, but I'd like to invest in a, a Streamlight at some point, something with a pressure pad. I can get to that button easy enough like this, but a pressure pad would be a little handier to have on there. And you really need a flashlight, even if you have night vision. Uh, flashlight, you're really gonna need for home defense because you don't wanna be walking around the corner, you hear a thump in the night, and then you smoke your wife in the face by accident because that just won't be good. So having a way to identify your threat or non-threat is critical because you don't want to go to jail and accidentally shoot your own dog before the ATF gets there. Now, a lot of the old timers are gonna say, oh, you don't want a flashlight on your gun. It'll give away your position. Well, no, stop being a FUD. Special forces, military, police, they all have torches on their weapons for a reason. You need it and you have a pressure pad or some quick activation on there so you're not walking around just spotlighting the entire LZ. You have that on there so when you're lined up with your target, you hit that light, and at that point, you're already aimed in so you can get around on them before you give away your position. And a lot of times you can blind them out with it if it's dark out. So don't listen to the people that tell you that it gives away your position. That's just a load of fuddery crap. Let's talk about slings. You may notice that I don't appear to have a sling on here. It's because mine's over here. This is just called the Centrifuge Training Sling. The company that makes it is Centrifuge Training. Uh, this sling was developed by them. They aren't a production company. They're a training company, a uh, training academy. Works specifically with the FBI and Secret Service. Uh, they wanted a compact sling holds to the side of your rifle. You see a lot of people on deployment, they've got a rubber band around their sling or taped off or something to keep up out of the way. They figured there's gotta be a way other way. So what they did, they came up with this hook and loop system where you pull this just down like that and there's your sling. A sling is a necessity. You never know if you're gonna have to hop over a fence or a wall or something. You don't wanna just toss your rifle over or if you're just on patrol, you don't wanna have it on you all the time on low ready. It's nice to be able to just sling it across. There are all different kinds of slings you can choose from. You got your three point slings, your single point slings, and this is a two point sling. Two point slings, meaning it's attached at two points, quick detach on the stock, and the standard loop on the front. A uh, single point sling will normally attach right behind your back plate on your buffer tube under the castle nut. And that's just a single point on there that hangs off you loosely. That's good for certain people. I've used both. I can't decide what I like yet. I really like this just for the way it stays on the rifle like that. It's nice to be able to throw it under the bed or in a car or something like that for transport easily. Not have to deal with it falling all over the place. So invest in a good sling. Slings aren't something you have to spend a whole lot of money on. These, This one was under a hundred bucks. Uh, you can get anything from like the paracord slings which have a tendency to unravel you can get a cheap surplus nylon sling for 20 bucks uh, slings are cheap so make sure you invest in one of those don't get an airsoft one just get something a little quality at least don't buy anything for your fighting rifle off amazon just 
don't, there's such a high chance that's going to be a Chinese knockoff and you're going to get screwed and not realize it until it's too late. Another important thing are your magazines. Quality magazines are important. Uh, I used to use GI mags all the time. Recently switched to Magpul. Both are great magazines. The old GI mags, if you replace the spring and the follower with a self-leveling follower, they're going to work just fine. Uh, they're a little more compact than Magpul mags, but I really don't know why Magpuls are superior. I guess they just look cool. A lot of people like Lancer mags. I don't like the style personally. They work just as good as a Magpul or GI mag. Uh, a lot of people run Mission First Tactical mags. They're cheaper option. They, uh, one, they're ugly. Two, they're made of plastic, not polymer, I believe. I could be wrong on that, but I've been told by multiple people that they're much cheaper plastic or polymer than P mags are. So I stay away from those, and I've heard they have some feeding issues as well. But again, I can't personally state on that. I've never run them. Hex mags were kind of popular for a minute there. I've heard their build quality is similar to P mag. They just look all space agey. So if you're going for a futuristic theme rifle, knock yourself out. I've heard they work fine. Again, no personal experience with them. Uh, Tapcom Pro mags, no, just don't. Don't. Another thing to think about is your stock, or if you're wearing a pistol like this, a brace. This is the SBA-4 adjustable sliding brace. It works on a standard buffer tube. SB Tactical has done some really amazing things with the pistol brace market. Uh, the fact that they can mount them on a standard buffer tube now is good on them for working with the ATF to get around that. The NFA is ridiculous and needs to burn that document mm. don't get me started on the nfa mm -mm. but a stock or a brace get something sturdy that's important uh, some of you are familiar with mortaring that is when your bolt is locked closed on a round whether it be live or spent uh, you can't get the bolt open so what you have to do is you have to collapse your stock all the way and literally mortar the stock into the ground with the barrel up and let the centrifugal force slam that bolt out and if you put a cheap airsoft stock on your buffer tube that cheap plastic is going to shatter when you mortar that thing so if you're getting an adjustable stock make sure you get a real rifle stock uh, fixed stocks are nice if you're running like a m16 style uh, fix, fixed stocks are a perfectly good option for that too and really sturdy uh any brace by sb tactical especially their newer ones they're great great quality i can't tell this isn't a stock it just it feels just like one when you're running it and it looks a lot like a, a retro m4 stock as well so i really like it a lot now things to avoid on your fighting rifle bipods you do not need a bipod on a fighting rifle they're bulky they're a snag point and they're useless you do not need it on something that you're not going to be shooting long range with. You are perfectly capable of functioning without a bipod. They do not belong on a fighting rifle. Bipods belong on marksman rifles and sniper precision rifles. Something where you need that stability for long range accuracy. You do not need one on a 16 inch rifle with a red dot. It doesn't make any sense. Pointless gadgets. There's so much cheap Chinese junk on Amazon and Wish app and eBay. You could buy all kinds of worthless crap like lasers. You don't need a laser. They're so useless these days. They were cool in the 80s. We're not in the 80s anymore. Do you see a carry handle on this thing? No, you don't need a laser. Excessive grips. You don't need a vertical grip or an angled foregrip. You don't need stuff like that necessarily. Something short like this, I would love if the ATF would still let me have a vertical grip on it. But as you know, when Trump gave them permission to reclassify the bump stocks, they started going crazy reclassifying everything. So last year, they told us that we're no longer allowed to count the brace in our overall length. So I can no longer have a vertical grip on this short pistol. So yes, yeah, something like this, where it's this short, a straight vertical grip can be handy. Uh, you don't need, I don't like angled foregrips, if that's your cup of tea, 
I mean, go for it, but a lot of people just do it because it looks cool. You don't need them. Magwell grips, Magwell funnels, you don't need them. This is not a proper grip. It can be handy for certain situations, but you don't need a grip there. If you have a vertical Magwell and a magazine, why do you need a grip there? No. Canted iron sights. Some people like them. I don't personally see the reason to them. Again, you have two sets of sights hanging off the side of your rifle. That's a huge snag point. It's gonna catch on gear, catch on obstacles. Uh, having just backup sights like I have here. This is a, what is it called? A lower three quarter co-witness, a lower co-witness. Even though it doesn't line up with the EOTEX reticle, I can still use my iron sights through the lower part of the glass of the EOTEC. So they don't have to be canted and they don't add anything on the side of the rifle. Angled, canted iron sights just really aren't necessary. Wacky muzzle devices. You see the kinds with like the spikes or they're like three inches long or all kinds of crazy stuff. Just get a basic flash hider muzzle device. You don't need to go all crazy fancy on it. Uh, if you run a suppressor like I do, uh, a quick detach muzzle device can be nice. This is a uh, Yankee Hill Machine Company quick detach. Lastly, anything that's going to add weight. Anything that you don't absolutely need on your rifle that you just think, hey, that would look cool, that's when you should log out of eBay. Anything that you're just bolting on because you think you'll look tactical, you're just going to break your back on. Ounces equal pounds equals tons. You're just going to keep adding more and more weight. It's going to stress on your body. You know, by the time you're in full kit, you've got, depending on what kind of plate you're running, you can have 20, 30, 60 pounds of gear, not to mention whatever it is in your backpack. That will take a toll on you, even when you're in good shape. Anyway, that's my opinion on the basics of a fighting rifle. Uh, if you have any questions, disagreements, comments, just want to talk to me, hit me up, message me, leave something in the comments, share and like and subscribe. Catch you next time.